This program is brought to you in part by SalCal Real Estate Connections. Welcome to Race in Action today. We're here today at the Greenwich Concours de Elegance, a festival of speed and style. In today's show, we're going to be covering the two-wheel version in the automotive industry. And let me tell you, these bikes are something special. There will be something here for everybody. I think you better find yourself a very comfortable chair and relax. We're about to see what the Greenwich Concours de Elegance is all about and the people who make it happen. We are getting ready to talk to H.C. Morris, who owns this absolutely beautiful collection of Triumph Bonneville motorcycles, and I'm sure you're going to find them very interesting. Yes, we have H.C. Morris, who just owns these absolutely gorgeous Triumph motorcycles, and I'll tell you something, this collection is something special. How did you ever get involved in doing this? Well, I bought one, and the guy that I bought it from, Said, well, you can't get just one, you need to get some more. And I said, no, this is the one I wanted. I ended up with all five of them, that's all they made. They made one for each year from 63 to 67. I was lucky enough to find a 63 because there's only seven of them made. So once I got all five of them together and got them restored, that means that it's one of two complete collections in the world. Wow. Are they all Bonnervilles? They're all Bonnervilles, they're all race bikes. They were sent, built just for the United States, or built in England but sent over to the United States and started out with Johnson Motors in Pasadena, California mm -hmm. because they were racing out in California big time then and they made the motors to his spec and then just took the regular Bonneville and threw the big motor in it and started off racing. This collection, not this collection specifically, but this type bike won more races from 63 to 67 than all the other brands put together. Oh my dear. Now is that like flat dirt tracking? Flat tracking, hair scrambles anything of that nature. They used to take them, take them on the street, and, and it used to be the sports and the TTs out there running each other. Yeah, these Triumphs have a soft spot in my heart. Uh, I'll tell you, I had one when I was a kid, and I wish I could get another one because uh, I just love watching them. Yeah, they're good bikes. I always like them because there's a fella that was a couple of years older than me when I was growing up, and he had a, an Aubergine and White, which is a 67. They call it Aubergine White because you know how the British are. They didn't want to call it purple or plum or so French was for kumquat or something like that, and they wanted to call it that. So <laughs> anyway, that's Aubergine and White. And I, the feller had one. It was fastest thing around us. He called it Little Booger. And I said, i got to have one of them. Now, I mean, where did you find these bikes? All over the country? Or? All over the country. I mean, I've been everywhere trying to find the bikes. The 64 and the 65, all I found was a... Of the frame and the motor, you know, and then we built everything else. Oh, my dear. It had to be a handful to find all the parts. Yes, sir. It's uh, five years. Five years building them. You think there's still some out there left to be had? There are the later models, like the 66, 67, 65s are getting hard to find. 64s are near impossible, and 63s, if I knew where one other one was, I sure have it. But there's a lot of fakes like in anything in the motor industry now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I have to commend you. They are certainly a, a beautiful group of bikes. And if you had to pick a favorite here, what, do you have one? Not really. I, uh, it just, I like them all. I, uh, I think that, uh, uh, you know, the 67, I think, is beautiful. 66 grows on you because it got that orange stripe on it. The uh, 65, I love that blue and silver. I don't know. They're all nice. I, yeah, yeah, I have to agree with you. If I had my pick, I don't even know which one I would pick. But I'll tell you, you, you got to be commended. They're beautiful, and uh, I'm sure you're going to have some fun at this event. Oh, yeah, it's good people. Can't help it if you all talk funny and everything like that, but that, that's all right. Oh, don't worry. You're talking okay, and uh, I'm sure we're going to have a good time here, and I want to thank you for spending some time with us. Thank you, sir. I Thanks, H.C. It. You are just great. Thank you, sir. I'll have to tell you, H.C.'s collection of Triumph Bonneville motorcycles is just unbelievable. You could see the passion in his eyes when you're talking to him about these motorcycles. He has done one outstanding job. And now we're going to let him talk about a very special bike that a good friend of his has put together. And believe me, 
you will find this very interesting. My name is H.C. Morris. I'm out of Winchester, Kentucky. I'm up here at the Greenwich Concourse. I brought along a 1974 Triumph Bonneville. What makes this bike a little bit different is that a friend of mine built it. He built it for himself. He built Triumphs all his life. He said, once my kids get raised, he said, I always wanted to go to Alaska. Well, the only thing he'd ever worked on or built was Triumph, so he's going to ride one. But he said, be my luck, I'll get up there and it'll quit on me. So he just built this one. He extended the frame eight inches, took two tanks and made it into one, extended the seat, and put two motors in it. Those are 274, 1974, 750 cc Triumph motors. He took the one in the back and turned the head around backwards so that it runs backwards is the way it runs. And then he took the case on this side and took it off and made another case for it because you're covering two crankcases now. This bike is kick start and it uh, has no compression release so you're kicking over two 750 motors at one time. And once you go inside the cases this bike will run on both motors right now. But let's say you're running down the road and one of them quits. You take the side case off. You take the chain off. You've got an idler pulley in there. Whichever motor is running, you wrap it around that sprocket, wrap it around that idler pulley uh, with the other one, and then you're ready to run on a still good motor, and that's the way you make it down the road. And uh, it's one of one. It's completely, you know, completely original. It runs out to about 140 mile an hour. Hardest things keeping clutches in it. We put about 40 some odd miles on it this last week and get it ready to bring up here. And um, Bill never did make it to Alaska right after he built this bike and everything. He was sitting at a stoplight on another motorcycle and some woman in a big Buick decided to run over him, broke his neck and his back, so he never did get to take it. So I sort of take care of it for him. We run around and play with it and let people enjoy it. And that's what it's all about. Thank you now. I will tell you, I've seen a lot of things in my day, but a twin engine Triumph motorcycle is not one of them. This bike was just gorgeous. And AC, as you could see, made sure that it, it just stays just like it was brand new. And uh, we're going to be going over to look at some of these other bikes that did get some awards today. And believe me, this, this collection of bikes was really something from the early 1900s right up until the 50s and 60s. I mean, it, it was just unbelievable what was at this show. I can't get over, uh, and some of them were like original bikes. They weren't even restored. I mean, this Greenwich Concourse, the Elegance, has everything. And believe me, way do you... Uh, see what some of these bikes are and the people who actually own them. Good afternoon everyone. Uh, why do I do the motorcycles? Because I love them so much and if you have a love for the two-wheeler like I do I'm, I'm sure you'll understand what I'm talking about. We have a fantastic array of motorcycles uh, before you right now, some of which you wouldn't see if you traveled thousands of miles and went to every museum there is. Uh, some truly extraordinary uh, motorcycles. We're gonna start right over here with a Triumph. This is a 63 Triumph. Uh, the owner is H.C. Morris from Winchester, Kentucky. The relevance here is that if you go over to the display right over here, there is one of these motorcycles representing 1963 all the way up to 1967 when Triumph was heavily involved in racing. This was Triumph's first racing bike right here. It's a completely stripped down road bike, just strictly built for racing. Notice there's no lights on it or anything. This was a, a true racer. This one is very rare. It's one of only seven built. And um, if any of you know your engine stats, this bike has a compression ratio of 12.5 to 1 and it has a kickstarter. 
So you need a really, really strong, strong leg to start this fight. Again, the owner is H.C. Morris from Winchester, Kentucky, and we certainly appreciate you bringing your collection down here today. Thank you very much. And the collection will be here tomorrow as well. Our next motorcycle, built not too far from here, it's a 1941 Indian, the black one right over here. And this is owned by Roland Hude from Andover, Massachusetts, and the bike was built in Springfield, Massachusetts, not too far from where he lives. Uh, this is an Indian 4, better known as the Duesenberg of motorcycles. This is one of the, this is the best bike you could have bought for 1941. Very expensive, you can tell it's an inline four-cylinder engine. This was Indian's most luxurious motorcycle available at the time. Note the classic styling on this bike, the swept back fenders, half the wheel completely covered, the fringe on the seat, this is classic Indian styling. We also have an award for this bike, it is the most outstanding motorcycle post-1920. So who would please come up? Thank you very much. Thank you. Beautiful motorcycle, thank you very much. Our next bikes are actually have the, uh, by the way, if you want me to take that out and tell me what you think of how it rides, I'd be glad to. If you guys will wait about a half hour, just give me the keys. Oh. <laughs> The rest of the bikes are all uh, part of a collection. Uh, first one, a 1915 uh, Harley-Davidson. It's a Model J. Which one is that? Uh, the owner is David Pusiak. Dave, which, can you point out which one it is for us? Look at how he's dressed. It doesn't get any better than this. And look at this bike. Completely original. This is a Harley Model J, a true survivor. It is not restored. Believe it or not, this Harley just competed in the 2010 Cannonball Coast to Coast Run from Kitty Hawk, South Carolina to Los Angeles, California. 2,000, 3,294 miles. And it got a perfect score. And it did it all under its own power. Not bad for a 96 year old bike. I gotta ask, how did it feel when you were done? My butt was sore. You took the first, you took the first class. Well, like that, that right? my bar bill for 19 days on the road. <laughs> <laughs> Next bike that David owns is a 1916 Harley Davidson. This is a Harley Model R8 valve racer. This is the one he drove up on. The, the one that sounds like a row of cannons going off in your face when it goes by. Uh, yes, it has eight valves per cylinder. Only three of these were built in 1916. They were all for racing. It's a board track racer. It was not sold to the general public. It was a racer. The Model R was capable of speeds of up to 110 miles per hour, which was unheard of at that time. It sold new for $1,500 compared to $300 for a regular Harley. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, no throttle, no brake, just on or off, right? On or off, yeah. Okay. How did they stop it? No one lived to tell us. We don't know. Uh, <laughs> but there it is right there. Great bike. Uh, Dave's next bike. I, I love this bike. Beautiful bike. 1914 Flying Merkel. And Dave, can you show us that one? Not that we can. <laughs> this is a Merkel, and they came out of Milwaukee in 1902. Merkel was the first to use a patented spring fork on their bike. Uh, the company moved to Potsdam, Pennsylvania in 1909. This one is nicknamed the Banana Tank Bike for obvious reasons. Um, orange was also Merkel's standard factory color. Okay. The Merkel company went bankrupt in 1916, that was it, no more bikes for Merkel. Less than five of these racers were built, and you're looking at one of them right here. So it's a very rare bike, you should take a look at it. This bike also has an award, it's the most outstanding pre-1920 motorcycle. Beautiful bike. David also, I love this guy's collection, okay? I've only got three, I'm jealous. Uh, this is a Harley Model K with an F engine for street use. That would be this one right here. Very nicely restored. Harley built 16,284 bikes in 1914. They were already way ahead of Indian at the time and most other manufacturers. David acquired this bike in 2000 and restored it in 2005. And yes, that is Harley's factory colors for the year 1914. The way you see it right there. Beautiful bike, a nice restoration. Very nice. And I believe our last one Dave owns is a Harley Model K board track racer. That would be that one right there. This is a special A performance engine. This was Harley's first professional racing bike. Top speed for this bike, 90 miles an hour, which when you look at it, must be pretty scary. 
And it, again, as with our other R8 racer, it has no brakes, no clutch, no throttle. It's all go or nothing. I believe the way that they actually kept the speed round was to cut the magneto, let it coast, and just bring it back up. Just <laughs> drag your feet with strong work boots on. This is a very rare bike. Only three of these are known to exist. Uh, that's our bikes for today. We will have more bikes out tomorrow. Uh, I'd like to give these guys a big hand. As a motorcycle enthusiast, it just doesn't get any better than this. Uh, and I'm going to hand it over to some colleagues of mine. Uh, we're very, very special today to be treated to our drive-by commentary by not only two of the best automotive journalists that I know, but I have the privilege of calling them two of my very good friends, uh, Larry Prince and Jed Rappaport. Thank you, everyone. the noise ordinances, the exhaust ordinances, the safety ordinances, and there's probably nothing he's missed. How about a quick round of applause for all the motorcycles? While at the show, we did film a lot of uh, performance cars in the muscle car era, and this 69 Roadrunner was just one great example of what was sold in that time period. I mean, the car just like they drove it off a showroom floor with those red line tires, and the color I know at the time was very popular for this Roadrunner group. Seeing this Roadrunner really brought back a lot of memories as it was kind of the time period that I was growing up as a teenager. And believe me, looking at the inside of this car and looking at that National Hot Rod Association sticker brought back a lot of memories. I mean, this car was really correct. I really didn't see anything at all out of place. The next car we looked at was this beautiful 1970 Mercury Kruger XR7 and it was just a great example of what a Kruger looked like in the day and the color too was another popular color uh, that people really liked and I'll tell you the car was just gorgeous. It had some things on it that I quite, uh, I really never saw before. Those blue line tires were really something special. I've never seen those before. But uh, this car was actual, actually uh, a very low mileage car to begin with. And as you could see, was kept in absolutely pristine condition. If memory serves me correct, the taillights on these Cougars were like sequential that uh, they shared with, along with Thunderbirds of the day. And the interior of this car was absolutely pristine too. I mean, uh, being a, a four-speed car made it really special. And the inside was just as clean as the outside. Just one great example what a car looked like in that time period.
Another very special high performance car of the period was this Boss 429 Mustang. And believe me, they didn't make many of these cars and that Boss engine is very well sought after today. The reason for this Boss Mustang to come into existence was the fact that they needed to get the motors okayed for NASCAR racing. And boy, I'll tell you, they are something special. The insignias on the fender say it all. And being a white car, too, uh, most of these cars uh, came in solid colors. Yeah, but this car is really stunning. I mean, the wheels are special and... You know, the, the gas cap, too, has uh, the Mustang insignia and it had the, the spoiler. I mean, they are very, very sought-after cars, and they're very rare. And I'll tell you, this car looks like it just rolled off the showroom floor. That's how clean it is. The interior in this Mustang was all business and uh, the color combination of the white car and the black interior really was excellent. I mean, uh, I'd love to park it in my garage and yeah, that 429 NASCAR sticker kind of says it all. Yes, that license plate, wing car, can only mean one thing. 1969 Dodge Daytona. And this green car really typified what one looked like. It had a Magnum, I believe a 440 engine in it. And uh, the, they pay attention to detail just unbelievably. I mean, nothing looks out of place. Just an absolutely gorgeous car with uh, every part of the car was just like it was brand new. And yeah, that uh, stripe in the back, this is how they came, along with that huge wing that really made a big splash at, at Daytona and places uh, like that when the NASCAR circuit. And boy, I'll tell you, they certainly won their share of races. No question about that. Looking at the car from behind, it's just awesome look with that wing. You expect this thing to just take off from a runway, just like it was an airplane. This car had a black interior, and like the rest of the cars we looked at was absolutely pristine. And the fact that it was a four-speed car made it all the better. It just brings you right back to your childhood when you look at a car like this. The muscle car era is alive and well, and believe me, this example of it is really just uh, an absolute joy to see. Another high performance car at the event was this 1969 Shelby Mustang. And look, judging by, uh, yeah, that insignia, that snake there is just uh, <laughs> something special. And believe me, this car was gorgeous. I, I don't remember seeing so many beautiful cars that I had at this event. I mean, this Shelby was just stunning. And believe me, they don't make many of these cars. They're, they're really rare. You just don't come across them every day. 
This was just a beautiful example of what was sold in the day. The engine compartment was no different than the outside of the car. Just stunning. And that uh, Shelby motor really is a f favorite icon worldwide. I mean, these cars are really sought after. Another interesting car at the event was this Oldsmobile uh, that was made by Hearst. It was a Hearst edition which uh, they kind of uh, are not easy to come by too. Most of them were this color, uh, white with gold, but I did, I did think that you could get them in black also. But this car was really something. I just can't get over how the paying attention to detail and no matter where you look on the car, it just looks like a brand new car. And it was a real pretty car, too. I mean, talking with the, the owners of the car, you could really see their attraction to them. I mean, they really have a big of history as any other uh, type of motorsport you could imagine. Right down to what color the engines are and uh, just something that you don't see every day. And the interior of the car, too, same thing. Just absolutely gorgeous. And with that famous Hearst shifter, made it all the more something special. We come to the conclusion of our show today, and I hope everybody has enjoyed it as much as we have producing it. It has been just one outstanding event here at the Greenwich Concours de Elegance. And I want to thank our crew for all the great things they do. And I want you to tune in next week for our next episode of Racing Action Today. This program is brought to you in part by SalCal Real Estate Connections. Thanks to the Race in Action Today crew, Dwayne Cody, Bill Majak, David Seidlinger, and Lisa Backus. And also we want to thank our home station, Nutmeg TV for all their support and all the great things they do.